The mystery, which is the love that we call God, is with you all. Thanks be to all that is holy. On behalf of Holy Cross Lutheran Church, welcome to worship as we celebrate all saints. Holy Cross is an inclusive community which is progressive in approach and Christ-like in action. My name is Don Hutchings and I am privileged to serve as the pastor at Holy Cross. Thank you for joining this All Saints worship service. If you would like to follow along, the order of service can be downloaded from our website, holycrosslutheran.ca. Once again, I'm coming to you from our empty sanctuary, so it'll be a little echoey in here today. Um, let me take a moment to welcome Pastor Eric Schultz, who will also be providing leadership as we worship. Eric is a member of Holy Cross, and he also serves on our church council. So take a few deep breaths as we prepare ourselves for worship by listening to our musician Marnie Kern's beautiful prelude. As always, we worship as we live in the midst of the one who is beyond the beyond and beyond that also, our creator, Christ, and Spirit One. Amen. The grace of Christ who rises in every act of loving kindness, the love that is the source of all being and the power of the Spirit is with you all. Thanks be to all that is holy.
morning. An All Saints greeting from my house to yours. Typically, we gather in the sanctuary at Holy Cross and light candles together. But during these COVID times, we are not physically gathering. So we invite you to be part of the All Saints ritual by lighting a candle or candles in your home. Big or small, a taper, a pillar, a votive, even one of these little electric candles, it doesn't matter. One of the benefits of a pre-recorded message such as this is you can press pause when you need to. If you don't have a candle close by, I invite you to press pause and go get one so that you can have one lit near you today for our All Saints worship. Don't forget to bring a match or something else to light your candles with. Remembering the life and death of a loved one sometimes touches the pain and grief of sorrow. It may take us to a dark place. Only in darkness do we really appreciate the light of a flickering flame. The light does not remove the darkness, but provides us the ability to see in the darkness. Many times our saints, those who have died and those who are still with us, are a light to us. We begin by lighting the candle of grief. This candle represents our grief and the depth of our loss if one or more of our saints is no longer with us. We feel the pain of losing our loved ones, all that they have meant to us, and the dreams that we had together. This is the candle of memory. It represents our memories of them. We remember the times we laughed together and cried together. For the saint or saints that are still with us, we look forward to making more memories. This is the candle of courage. It symbolizes the courage to confront our sorrow and to share our feelings openly with each other. This is the candle of hope. It represents hope for the future. If there is pain or loss, we hope it will soften as we move forward toward healing and peace. This is the candle of thanksgiving. It represents the many things that we are thankful for, things that we have received from the saints in our lives. Perhaps it is wisdom shared, understanding in challenging times, or just the constant presence when needed. And the candle of love. This candle represents our love given and received, a love that is shared in times of joy and sorrow, the love that we call God in the lives of our saints. Love, thanksgiving, hope, courage, memory, and yes, grief are often characteristics of the saints in our lives. I invite you now to light your candle in honor of the saints in your lives as we worship together.
Let us pray. Surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we stand in the presence of our Maker to offer our thanks and praise for life. Let our knowledge and experience of the joys and wonders of creation be ever expanding as we continue to follow wherever Christ leads us. Let the power of the Holy Spirit breathe in, with, and through us so that day by day we can live up to our own sainthood and everyone we meet may know that we are God's by our love. In the name of the one who is, our lover, beloved, and love itself. Amen. A reading from the Gospel writer we know as Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside. And after he sat down and the disciples gathered around, Jesus began to teach them. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who are mourning. They will be consoled. Blessed are those who are gentle. They will inherit the land. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. They will have their fill. Blessed are those who show mercy to others. They will be shown mercy. Blessed are those whose hearts are clean. They will see God. Blessed are those who work for peace. They will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of their struggle for justice. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Since this pandemic began, more than 1.2 million people around the world have died from COVID-19. In Canada, the death toll exceeds 10,000 people. In Ontario, more than 3,100 people. And here in York Region, 267 people have died from COVID-19. Sadly, millions more people have died alone of the regular stuff which causes our bodies to perish. This year, as a result of public health restrictions, Death has been a lonely endeavor for both the dying and for the grieving. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. But how do we mourn and, and how shall we be comforted in the midst of a pandemic? So much of what I would call popular cultural Christianity imagines the divine mystery, which is the source of all that is the source of all life, as a kindly old gentleman in the sky, from whom we should seek comfort from the pain of death. This image of the divine mystery is readily offered to the dying and to those who mourn as a kind of talisman who alone can provide the necessary comfort. All we need is just to have faith in the various visions offered to us by the faithful of an afterlife. So it doesn't surprise me that those of us who have given up worshiping personifications of the mystery which is the divine love in which we are all one, we are left longing for a way to mourn and to comfort which does not require that we worship the idol of an all too small sky god which we once worshiped. Today, as we remember all the saints who have gone before us, together with all the saints who dwell among us here and now, my heart goes back to the wisdom imparted to me by a particular saint who taught me so much about the ways in which the divine mystery works in, with, through, and beyond us to comfort those who mourn. This particular saint had no family. She lived alone, and for the purposes of this sermon, I will call her Sophia. 
Sophia, the Greek word for wisdom. I became her pastor because she knew somebody who used to be a member of the congregation which I serve. When the doctors told her that she was dying, she thought that she ought to have a pastor. So via a friend of a friend, I was summoned to her bedside. I was afraid. I had been told that she only had a few weeks before the cancer would, and I quote, take her, not die, but that the cancer would take her. No one used the word death or said that she was going to die. To be present to a stranger when they are so close to death is a daunting task. No time for gentle hellos or warming up to one another, just a, a long, painful, and sometimes awkward goodbye. I went to Sophia's bedside every day for weeks. Some days, when she was able, the questions, they, they just tumbled out of her. She wanted to know what I believed. Not any pat answers. She didn't want those. She didn't want trite platitudes. Just the facts, she would say. Just give me the facts. I liked her no-nonsense approach, even though I knew that the meager facts which I possessed might not sustain us on our journey. It didn't take long for me to figure out that she'd spent a great deal of time in the church. Her parents saw to it that she was raised in the church. But a lifetime of tragedy and heartache had led her far away from the faith she had grown up with. But as death drew near, she longed for the certainty of her youth. She'd like to believe. It would be nice to think that there would be a place for her, not exactly heaven per se, but some place heavenly, like Paris in the springtime. She so loved Paris in the springtime. If only heaven were full of cafes and patisseries where she could while away the hours talking with others who, like her, appreciated the finer things of life. Life. Would there be life beyond death? She'd like to believe so. One morning, I stopped by the bakery and picked up some of the most Parisian looking pastries I could find. And then I swung by a coffee shop and had them grind up some fresh beans. And as I brewed the coffee in Sophia's kitchen, the aroma wafted up the stairs and she shouted down to me that I should heat up some milk so that we could have lattes. It was as heavenly a breakfast as we could muster. Our conversation took us back to Paris and a springtime before I was born when Sophia was young and beautiful and the men all fell at her feet. Some of her stories actually made me blush. We laughed and we laughed and we laughed until we cried. After Paris, we traveled to London by way of some excellent fish and chips and a few glasses of cider London was wet and cold. Sophia managed to complete her studies, even though a certain young man begged her to give up work and come to be his love. Over sausages and beer, we traveled to Hamburg, where Sophia fell in love with an orphanage full of refugee children. By the time our conversations took us to India, Sophia was far too ill for a curry, so we sipped tea as we wept over her stories of poverty and disease. One afternoon I arrived to find Sophia, Sophia's care worker crushing ice for mint juleps, and it took me a while to figure out that we were actually going deep into the southern states where Sophia had worked long and hard to establish a medical center among the poorest Americans. By the time our travels led us back to Newmarket, Sophia was growing weak, and I had gone from being a suspected Bible thumper to a trusted traveling companion. 
the most difficult part of our journey lay before us. What will become of me, Sophia pleaded. I told her that the doctors would see to it that there would be no pain. That wasn't what she was talking about. What will become of me? Will there be darkness? Or will I see a, a, a bright light? I don't know, was all I could honestly say. Sophia was patient with me. She asked me if I thought that there was more to life or if death was the end. No religious platitudes, if you please, just the facts. I don't know, Sophia. I believe that we live and die in God and that God is love. And in love, we have nothing to fear. All will be well. I trust that in death we fall into the love that is God. Sophia took my hand and firmly confessed, I am afraid. I didn't know how to comfort her, so I asked, what are you afraid of, Sophia? Not of dying, good God, no, I'm not afraid of dying, Sophia insisted. I'm afraid of being forgotten. Who will remember me? Who will remember the hundreds and thousands, the millions who have died this year? How shall we be comforted? Like most deaths, those who have died from the coronavirus have done so out of sight, removed from the public eye, and they have been mourned out of sight. In addition to those who have perished of the virus, there have been those countless deaths of loved ones that we have been unable to mourn in our usual ways. No gatherings at all. If we could manage it, sometimes we could have a tiny, physically distant funeral, scarcely able to do justice to our grief. Ever so faintly, Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount echo down through the generations. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Some translations say, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be consoled. Mourning is scarcely possible during these challenging times. It's as if we have been robbed of mourning's blessings. Blessed. Blessed. What does it mean to say blessed? The Greek word makairos, which is often translated as blessed, is also sometimes translated as happy. But happy are those who mourn is not a translation that makes much sense to me. Fortunately, there's another meaning for makairos, which, which does make sense. Makairos can also mean honored. Honored are those who mourn, for they shall be consoled. Honored are those who mourn. To mourn is to grieve, to lament, to show sorrow for the death of someone or the loss of something. And haven't we all lost so much this year? There is much in this life to mourn, losses of all kinds. For life is change. And in change, there are losses. As I look around this beautiful cemetery, there's a, a chill in the air. Last night, the temperatures dipped below freezing, a sure sign that the autumn is almost over and winter is indeed coming. All the signs together with the medical experts are telling us that this will be a very dark winter. In the midst of the sadness and grief which this pandemic has spread around the world, my attention is drawn to the leaves uh, which are tenaciously hanging on to these trees. As I marvel at their tenacity, I can't help but remember Sophia hanging on for dear life. I remember how I wept each time that I left her bedside. I also remember other griefs, 
losses which I have been privileged, honored to mourn. I say privileged because love is a prerequisite for mourning. We do not mourn unless we have loved or have been loved. Honored are those who mourn, for we shall be comforted, because every tear is pregnant with new life, like the fallen leaves which will provide the nourishment for new life. All that we are is not lost in our death. What we are forever impacts the whole in whom we live and move and have our being. Death is a transformation point into the mystery who is, was, and evermore shall be the very source of our being. For those of us who mourn, grief is a narrow passage through which we pass from death to new life. Without tears and dreams, there is no healing. Without laughter and singing, there is no savoring of what is and what is to come. Love is the tender life force which transcends even death. Honored are those who mourn, for it is love who consoles, the love which is the source of all being. Over and over again, Sophia's desperate plea, who will remember me, punctuated our conversations with fear which went beyond belief. No theological words or phrases about believing would suffice or comfort. Only the promise to remember her could bring any comfort at all. But who was I to make such a promise? So I hesitated. I tried to calm her fears with, with words. I tried to explain her fear away. And then one afternoon, Sophia took my hand and she asked me, about my travels, about my loves, my hopes, my dreams, and my fears. She said she wanted to be able to remember me. I was reluctant. This wasn't supposed to be about me. I was, after all, the pastor, the caregiver. The caregiver. There were lines which the books say should not be crossed. Sophia didn't care to be cautious. Time was of the essence. She wanted to remember me, and to do that, she needed to know me. So I came out from under the protection of my clerical office, and together we traveled back to the places which had shaped and molded me. Sophia and I became friends. If only for a brief moment in time, we were kin, each embodying love for the other. A few days before she died, a panic came over her as she feared what might become of her. Once more, holding tightly to my hand, she begged me, who will remember me? With all my heart, I promised, I will remember you, Sophia. Those men in Paris who fell at your feet all those years ago, the young man who fell in love with you in London, the children in Hamburg and the people in Kentucky, they will remember you. Your friends will remember you. And then I took a deep breath and I said, I will remember you. Her breathing calmed and her grip loosened and she began to smile. And then I asked her, Sophia, remember me? I will remember you, Sophia promised. And over the course of the next few days, as her death drew near, Sophia and I were kin for one another, embodying the divine for one another, loving one another, remembering one another. I remember you, my dear. It is an honor to remember you. You are part of me. It is in our remembering that the Holy One consoles us. 
This may indeed be a dark winter, but the light, which is the love which we call God, shines in, with, through, and beyond us as love empowers us to comfort those who mourn by being love to one another. Spring will come, the sap will rise, new leaves from buds will transform all our grief into hope. Blessed are we. All that we are is not lost at our death. What we are forever impacts the whole. The one who is love, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Blessed are we as we, we remember those we have loved and who have loved us. Blessed are we as we remember the saints who have walked among us and those who continue to dwell among us. Thanks be to the one who makes us whole, one with our lover, beloved, and love itself, who is beyond the beyond and beyond that also, love now and always. Amen. Let us pray. 
Surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we stand in the presence of our Maker to offer our thanks and praise for life. Let our knowledge and experience of the joys and wonders of creation be ever expanding as we continue to follow wherever Christ leads us. Let the power of the Holy Spirit breathe in, with, and through us so that day by day we can live up to our own sainthood and everyone we meet may know that we are God's by our love. In the name of the one who is, our lover, beloved, and love itself. Amen. The candles from my ritual at home are now here in the sanctuary, and we relight them, remembering the candle of grief. The candle of memory. The candle of courage. We relight the candle of hope, of thanksgiving, and the candle of love. In our lives, we are surrounded by a cloud of great witnesses and saints walk among us on this day. We honor those saints in our lives and we will begin by honoring those saints that we have lost from our Holy Cross family this year. And I will begin by lighting a candle for our dear sister, St. Phyllis. Another member of our Holy Cross family that we lost this year is Peter Smith.
we honor St. Tom, Tom Montpool. We honor and remember St. Erica, Erica Bradfisk. We honor St. Catherine, Catherine Orphanakis. We honor and remember Saint Katrine. Katrine Willen. We honor and remember Jakob Pilibit and family. We honor and remember St. Dorothy, Sharon Smith's aunt. We honor and give thanks for the life of St. Carl, Petra's godfather. We honor and give thanks for Carla, Petra's aunt. We give thanks for the life of Norma Thompson, fondly known as Jack. For the life of Bill Duncan, we give thanks. We give thanks and we honor the life of St. Verna, Verna Wagford. For saints Martha and Clarence Wegford, we give thanks. We give thanks for the life of Saint Andrew, Andrew's cousin. Let us pray. Surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we hold in our hearts the people who have touched our lives and helped to nourish, ground, and sustain us in the sacredness of life. As we breathe deeply of the Spirit, 
Let us open ourselves to every opportunity to share our own sacredness with others as we live into our own sainthood. Let us be the love that is God to one another and to our sisters and brothers everywhere. We pray in the name of the mystery who is risen in us, the spirit who breathes through us, and our maker who loves through us, now and always. Amen. Amen. We gather to express the prayers of the people in our various communities. We do not pray to some far off distant sky god to ask that our needs be met. We pray trusting the mystery which we call God, who is love. Love in which we live and move and have our being love which lives in, with, through, and beyond us, so that all may know this love. Our prayers open us to this mystery, which is love, so that our thoughts, worries, and concerns might become love in the world. Let us begin to open ourselves to this love, which is God, by expressing our gratitude for the many blessings which continue to astound us. I'm very, uh, I'm very thankful for the abundance of food uh, we have available for us and um, thinking of those who struggle daily to put food on the table. I'm very grateful for our medical system going through tests at the moment and People are so polite and caring and helpful. I'm grateful for the heat in my home, but we just recently turned on as the weather gets better. I'm grateful for I'm grateful for the vastness of uh, our country, Canada the diverse peoples, the wildlife, the, just the, the extent of it, and for peace in this country. I'm grateful for all of the senses that I have that allow me to see and smell, to touch and taste the beauties of creation, uh, to see friends, uh, to see the colors change, um, things that we take for granted that we often need to be reminded to be grateful for. As we celebrate the saints among us, I invite you to express your gratitude for the types of saints which you are particularly grateful for. I'm very grateful for all the teachers who are working so very hard to uh, try to still make a meaningful contribution to all their students in whatever manner they are delivering that teaching. Um, so many of them are being stretched so far and uh, the demands on them uh, are almost doubled in terms of preparation and then evaluation afterwards. And yet they continue to carry on. I'm grateful for uh, <laughs> silent saints, uh, those that don't often stand on a pedestal, those that don't often get recognition, uh, those whose uh, gentle and uh, quiet wisdom uh, has been shared and continues to be shared in my life and the lives of many. I am grateful for those who have listened to me and continue to listen to me as I search for meaning and for 
um, faith in my life. Uh, there have been many, and not just um, individuals, but authors and poets who contribute wisdom. Thinking of uh, saints, uh, my mother came to my mind, so I'm thinking of all the mothers and fathers, the parents in our life um, who guide us and, and brought us up and are continuing to um, give us unconditional love. I'm grateful for all the people who are being responsible, taking steps to make sure that all those who are vulnerable are protected from the virus, et cetera. People that are changing their habits in order to protect other people. I'm grateful for the artists, the musicians, people who are trying to reconfigure their lives as sharing their art, dancers, uh, people who elevate our experience of life. Grateful for the very number of friends I have in my life, those who not only support me, but support so many others, um, stand by them, help them in, in every possible way. As I remember the, the life um, and witness of a beloved seminary professor, mentor, and friend, Harold Remus, um, I'm grateful for all those who, like Harold, have dedicated their lives to historical explorations which have enlightened so many of us um, and who was a person who not who didn't just teach pastors um, he embodied what it me means to be a pastor and so I give thanks for all those professors teachers and pastors who embody the love I invite you to express your concerns for the world. Strikes me that situations like this can bring out the best and the worst. That uh, the people who are afraid and grabbing whatever they can out of that fear and uh, that desperation and others who are awakening to uh, another way of being aware of others and realizing that this world is shared in ways that we sometimes forget. I'm concerned for those people who strongly believe that violence uh, and even murder is somehow a way of life and brings glory uh, and, and is the right thing to do and that they are so willing to do that at, at terrible expense and grief of others. As the uh, days get colder and the nights get colder, I'm concerned about all those who are homeless at the moment, who have no way of um, finding a sheltered place. And um, all the, the uh, hostels or shelters, um, which already have been overcrowded, that there's not enough room for those who really need to have a safe and warm place. I think of all the displaced persons, whether that be locally or globally. Uh, those that uh, are no, no longer have a, a place of their own to call home, or whether they be in uh, displaced persons camps or refugee camps, uh, whatever it is that, uh, that they might have some shelter, some care, uh, some presence of the love that we call God in the midst of uncertainty. Concerned for those in prison, especially those who, who are innocent those who are in solitary confinement when they shouldn't be, for, and for those who work uh, in prisons as well for their difficulties and um, 
for that chosen profession? I'm concerned for the political leaders of all nations at all levels who have to make decisions about how to protect the population and bear the results, good or bad. I feel for the people in Nice and France, Europe, that suddenly this random scary thing happens and finding a wise response um, is really daunting. I'm concerned for those who are voting in the next few days for their safety and um, for a, a, a smooth transition, if there is one, um, just, just that they be safe. Yes, and our, our hearts go out to our American cousins, um, especially those who join us in prayer um, on these in these strange, unusual ways of worshiping together, um, our hearts go out to you, and we recognize that the hopes and the fears of all the world um, are with you. Uh, and we pray for wisdom that you might elect leaders which will work for compassion in our world. I invite you to express your concerns for the people in your lives. I'm extremely concerned about my friend Sandra, who is continuing with cancer treatments and it weakens her and um, I hope she will have the <coughs> strength to go through it and has hope for the future. Pray for my friend Ruthie in Vancouver, whose husband died this week. Uh, he had been in a long-term care just for a few months, had just been placed there and had a sudden heart attack. So for Ruthie, as she gathers her family together and um, prepares for some memorial for Bruce, Concerned for my daughter and daughter in law and niece, all in the healthcare field and putting themselves on the line to help others get through this. Concerned for Larry and his family as he um, is palliative for his daughter, grandchildren, and, and Anne, his partner. As we remember the saints who have gone before us. We mourn the loss of all the saints who have been lost during this pandemic. We remember those who have endured death while separated from their loved ones. We remember those who have endured the loss of a loved one without the support of their communities. We remember all those who during this pandemic have been denied the comfort of longed for embraces. May the love which is divine mystery continue to work in, with, through, and beyond us so that all may know the comfort which comes from the compassion we share. We pray in the name of the one who is, our lover, beloved, and love itself. Amen. Amen.
all that we are is not lost at our death. What we are forever impacts the whole, the one who is love, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Blessed are we as we remember those we have loved and who have loved us. Blessed are we as we remember the saints who have walked among us and those who continue to dwell among us. Thanks be to the one who makes us whole, one with our lover, beloved, and love itself, who is beyond the beyond and beyond that also, now and always. Amen. And time for the announcements. You can find all of the announcements in the order of service, which you can download from our website, holycrosslutheran.ca. I just want to highlight our walk and talk in the park, which will begin this Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. This is an opportunity for us to safely meet and chat. We will gather in the parking lot at Ferry Lake in Newmarket um, at 10, uh, sorry, at 11 a.m., 11 a.m. on Wednesday for a gentle walk. Um, our topic this Wednesday is connections. The struggle to stay connected during these challenging times. Um, what are the vital connections in our lives? Uh, what do we need to let go of? What helps? What doesn't help? Uh, for a full listing of our weekly topics, you can go to our website and click on program and you will see um, what we'll be talking about on our weekly walks. Wednesdays, 11 a.m., Ferry Lake parking lot. I hope to see many of you there. Please um, make sure that you are on uh, our mailing list by simply sending an email to um, Holy Cross Lutheran, all one word, Holy Cross Lutheran at rogers.com and just ask to be put on our mailing list and then we will make sure that you are kept up to date on all of the events here at Holy Cross. All that is left is for me to bid you peace. Go in peace, be love in the world. Shalom, dear ones, shalom.